Hello. Hey. Oh, hey. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I heard you. How are you? How How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah. Not bad. I had a, a some time the other night. I was uh, hanging out with my kid, and uh, and I got on film. The film struck. <laughs> I got on film struck, and I didn't even know there was like a, a, a significant amount of your short works were up there. So yeah, it's uh, it's relatively new. So it was last week that they put them up. We've been talking to them since South by Southwest, but yeah, it's, it's new up. I think on Tuesday, yeah, oh. nine of my short films are on there now. Yeah, I um, I guess the wheels of progress grind slowly at the Filmstruck uh, company, but uh, it's good that they they did that, and it'll start warming people up to your filmmaking, you know. And then when Thunder Road, the feature comes out, well, they'll be well prepped. Yeah, I, I think so. I hope so. They, they have been so encouraging and so lovely and supportive. Like, I mean, I met them at South by Southwest, and they were mm-hmm. like, hey, we would love to have some of your work on here. And they saw the shorts, and they loved them. And I was, they were like, are these available on any, like, mm-hmm. platforms? And I was like, not all of them. Like, we could totally Vimeo. give them to you. And they were like, yes, we'll take them. And then I had to, like, re-edit them into, like, a professional mix So like, it took me a month and a half to really just like get them everything, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, they've been they've been really wonderful. They're so encouraging. They like made this special interview with me. Yeah, I saw that. It, it's it's just been it's a dream come true. I, I love them and I love the Criterion Collection and like to be in the same platform as as all of my favorite movies is a real dream come true. Oh yeah, and also I don't know that I mean I could be wrong, but I don't remember them having this kind of uh, program before where they put up like an emerging, as they call you, an emerging filmmaker. It seems like a new thing. I don't know. I mean, I, th- I, I think it is new. I think we might be the first. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's unprecedented. I yeah, think. but I, I mean, what they do is for on their catalog, they'll do something where it's like, okay, we yeah. have the worst eight of- Max von Sydow movies, and right. so for this week, we'll just be sure. highlighting yeah. his acting or like. Danny Kaye has right, well, you went, 10, you, 10 films on Filmstruck, but this is the first time where it's like a relatively newer filmmaker that they're like, hey, let me pluck this person up out of obscurity. Hey, I'll go a step further. I mean, you took possibly the oldest living actor alive as an example, but <laughs> <laughs> but I will go, you know, no, but I've seen like where they've, they've done like a thing with Alex Ross Perry or somebody like that, but he's got even like yeah. half a dozen features, you know, it's not typical where you haven't even officially put out your first i mean it's in this in the thunder road yeah. is, is in the uh the festival circuit but it, it, it it's not been out theatrically or or otherwise so it's it seems like a almost like an investment in uh and i really applaud it because that's what i try to do as well bring on people that are you know just sort of getting started and figuring out their way and i think that's interesting to hear about that's why i like to have people like yourself on the show yeah. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it's so important. It's it's so important. I try and do that as much as I can. I always say it's like bending the ladder back down. Like yeah. once you've gotten up there to like help out other people, and I feel like that's kind of how I've spent my last couple of years. It's it's really important to do that to help out emerging filmmakers. Also, what I like about what you've done here, and I know a lot of filmmakers put out lots of shorts first, but it, it really seems like you developed a voice. I watch, like I say, uh, right now on Filmstruck, there's a. Uh, was was minutes a web series or was it just a series of short films that were thematically tied? It was a web series that we did for a platform called Full Screen that ended up uh, shuttering its doors okay. in January, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, we released the six short films as a feature, so I like re-edited them as a feature. But all the time, like we knew that we wanted them to be cohesive. So like, yeah. there are characters that appear. Um, in all the other films, and like there's dialogue that's similar for all the films. There are all these like little Easter eggs that we had intended for people to watch it all together, and mm-hmm. so it just kind of worked as this um, I don't know anthology feature as well. Yeah. Um, but no, we we were uh, commissioned to do that, and then we got the rights back, so we were able to put it out and share it however we wanted. And uh, and Filmstruck, you know, they'd been two or three of the short films on my Vimeo channel, but they were like, no, we want all of them, and so they reached out to. Topic, who I, I did three more single-take short films with, and they were like, no, we just want to like do as many of these movies as we possibly can. And um, the only film that isn't on there is Thunder Road because of the Bruce Springsteen song. And right. um, the, the contract says that we can only have it on one platform, and, and it's on Vimeo. So. Oh, right. I guess that would be a thing. I was wondering, I was scratching my head, and I, I will just drop this in, in right now. So, yeah, I watched, I was at South by Southwest 2, and this past uh, spring or late winter, 
and everybody was talking about Thunder Road, and I couldn't get into the screening. Uh, this I was only there for the first few days, so I couldn't get in. I couldn't go oh, to a... No. Yeah, so I didn't get in. And even though Matt Miller's like, I, I guess I can call him a friend. I, I think we've, we've had enough run-ins, and <laughs> positive yeah. run-ins. And I knew a number of other people in, in Thunder Road, as you know. But uh, uh-huh. I, I didn't even know in South by that all my friends were in the movie. I might have made an extra effort to... <laughs> but anyway, long story short... I raced back and I watched the short. So, and I, okay, this, I definitely have to see the feature. And then when I watched the feature the other day, I was like, oh, why isn't the song in, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I shouldn't, maybe that's a spoiler, but I, now I certainly understand why. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. We had a, a good uh, line from Barbara at Quad Cinema the other day. We had a screening at Rooftop Films and, um, and she came up to me as at the after party, and she said, uh, you know, I was worried that you weren't going to put the song in the movie. And I said, yeah, yeah, we, we didn't put the song in the movie. And she says, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. And it was so lovely, because it's like, even though the song isn't in the movie, I know the true. entire movie is the song. And it's like, it's yeah, it was, it was the best review that I've gotten for the movie so far. And who said that? That was, um, that was, that was Barbara at uh, Quad Cinema in New York. She was great. Barbara at Quad Cinema? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, she I don't... this, um, this uh, art house theater. No, no, I know the Quad. Theory. Yeah, no, I know the Quad backward and forward. I just didn't know. I guess Barbara is a programmer. Who's that? Hey, Daniel. Hi. You want to your shoes? Uh, no. Okay. Hi, Daniel. Nice. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> this is Danny Madden. I'm on set with him right now for his feature called Beast Beast. Called what? Hello. Hey there. Hello, <laughs> What's the name of his movie? Beast Beast. It's the um, it's the feature film of the South by Southwest winning short film, Krista. Oh, sure. Bye bye. Bye Danny. Bye bye. A little guest appearance by Danny Madden. Wow. wow. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> no extra charge. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, two for one special. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I we didn't have the song in the film. It was um, we shot it both ways. We shot it with the song in the morning, and then we shot it without the song after lunch. Um, and we did that because we, I don't know, I, I wanted to, like, challenge myself and have this, like, alternate eulogy, and um, in case he or his team didn't want to have the song in the future, I was like, all right, well, why don't we just have safety? And then we were editing the film, and it worked better without the song because... At the end of the film, something happens which is very similar to the song, and I have, like, because the song doesn't work on the boombox, I'm forced to explain the song, <laughs> like, from an anthropological stance, uh, culturally. It's really funny, and um, it just becomes a, a bigger nosedive for the character. And um, in describing the song, that's kind of what happens at the end of the film. And so... Uh, if we had the song in, I, we wouldn't have that. Like in the short film, he doesn't get to explain what happens at the end of the song. Um, and he doesn't even get to that part in the short film. And so we thought it was important to, to do it. And then in the editing room, we were watching it, and my performance was so much better in the last take. And I was like, I don't think we, I think we're going to use this take. It'd be easier to not have it, you know, to have it without the song. <laughs> and then um, my producers were like, oh, yeah, that, that, that makes so much more sense. Obviously, it's going to be much easier to do it without the song. <laughs> and so very quickly, we were like, all right, I guess the Thunder Road movie isn't going to have the Thunder Road song in it. Maybe it would have felt in the feature version, given what you just said, it would have felt a little too on the nose to have the song. Is that what you're getting at? Or uh, No, no. I just I felt like it was. It, it just worked better. Like okay. I, I played, uh, we, we we did the takes that had the song in it, and then watched the whole movie. Yeah, and okay. It just felt like we were getting. Like I think that that kind of thing works in a short film because you're getting the payoff instantly. Yeah. Um, but the payoff for a feature is at the end of the film, and so like you kind of have to see the characters failing, and um, it, in the feature, it's a much bigger fail. Mm. So that when there is catharsis and redemption at the end of the film, that's the payoff instead of like. I don't know, losing the audience in the in the opening 15 minutes. Right. Yeah, it's like a big gag reveal that you're losing, yeah. you're losing at the top. I get it, yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. South By obviously was a great place to, uh, to premiere the film, it seems. 
Yeah, we loved it. It was uh, it, it was incredible. It was like we had yeah. unexpected. We we like obviously had a short film that people liked and could share and get excited about the movie, mm-hmm. but I, we had no idea that it was going to be sold out shows and that people were um, going to love it as much as they did. And so we were just like. It was it was a very strange experience. It was like crowd surfing or something to walk down the street and people were like, "Oh, it's the fucking guy." It's like, "Oh, this is the people, <laughs> the, the lovely people that made this movie." Um, like my, my whole team was there. Everybody came down. I think it was like we had probably twenty five people, thirty people from cast and crew. We shot it in Austin, so like you know, all of our background performers came out. Everybody who helped out in catering came out. It was like it felt like this kind of family affair. And then and then we won, and it was like. Yeah, it was a dream come true. It was, it was insane. We never, never expected to to be the like knockout film that was there. Well, congratulations! All these months later. Thanks. Dude. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, my, I should say, I told you, but uh, in the film there is a number of supporting characters, or what would you describe? I guess yeah. extras <laughs> plus. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, Frank Mosley early on. And he's he um, again. He's having a retrospective here in in about a week or so, so he'll be in town. And uh, sure. and then I didn't catch Chris Dubeck, although he's credited as having a yeah uh, a tiny part. Uh, an IMDb. Um, so there's a line in the movie where uh, so Chris Dubeck plays this guy from a law firm who comes it's like divorce paperwork. And uh, I see. and I was like, Chris Dubeck is one of my favorite actors. He's incredible in Creesha and is just like yep. such a fun dude to hang out with. And uh, and I was like, I, I have this part for you that I think you'd be really good for. And I was like, I was like, what's the what's the name of the character? <laughs> so the name of the character is guy in a nice suit on a bicycle. And then he was like, say no more. I'm gonna Ta- do it. That yeah. sounds amazing. And uh, and so he came on set and it, he was there for like you know six hours hanging out with us. And then we shot this quick scene. It was like. So he plays this dude, and then on IMDb, of course, we credit him. It says like Chris Dubeck, guy in a nice suit on a bicycle. Oh, it's really funny. Well, it's and he's he's in. It's, there's always the threat of that typecast, you know, uh, as as a guy <laughs> on the bike in this nice suit. But you know, whatever. I guess it's not the worst place to find yourself. Um, yeah. And then also, uh, who else? Uh, I noticed. Oh, oh, and of course, Bill Wise as uh, your yep. as your uh, captain of the police yep. department. You play an officer, and I guess we should just mention a few things about the film. You play an, uh, a police officer who is um, on a downward emotional spiral, I guess you could say. Yeah, having a nervous breakdown. Having a nervous breakdown with the, begins kind of with the loss of your mom, although I think the seeds were already maybe planted before that, since um, I, I, I just assume so. With the, some yeah, of the... he's going through a divorce and struggling to connect with his daughter, and and then he loses his mom, and then it's the first time he's really considerate of his time on this planet and legacy and life and love and family and um yeah that kind of throws him for a loop and uh and he has a meltdown it is really funny yeah there's a climax of the movie of him shouting while getting fired and it's it's one for the ages what was your writing process uh i mean did you um do this uh essentially on your own or were you working with were you collaborating yeah. I, I do it. I do. I did this film entirely by myself. My short films, I usually work with um, my, my buddy Dustin. Dustin, yeah. Uh, Dustin Hahn, who's incredible. Um, yeah. And the short with but, him, by the way, yeah. let's just plug that short well, that he actually acts in because it's unbelievable. That performance yeah, is the teacher, teacher. parent yeah. teacher. Is, uh, people really need to see it. Go ahead. Yeah, parent Sorry. teacher is one of the best things that I've done. It is. Yeah. It is unbelievable. It's a, a teacher having a meltdown at a parent-teacher conference in front of a bunch of parents, and uh, it's just this incredible analysis of the American public education system. And Dustin did like two months of research, interviewing every teacher that he could um, about the problems of yeah. the education system, and it is incredible. It is scary and yeah. extremely well performed. Yeah, Dustin is awesome in that. Um, and and I for can... this feature, I ended up writing it by myself. Um, I I had an idea of what the movie would be where I was like struggling for a year to try and find out how we make it into a feature and then it kind of clicked for me where I was like oh no this movie this short film can be the opening scene instead of the climax um, and then in having it be the opening scene you're kind of forcing the story to be a, more about the father daughter story so it's more about being a parent than losing a parent and I found that so interesting and I was like oh we get to do all this like heartwarming and tragic parent stuff 
as well as all the comedy, like the kind of Mike Judge, King of the Hill style comedy of like family relations in Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then have this kind of like Armando Yanucci style character having a meltdown and um, say something about the police and authority and um, masculinity in, in 2018. And, uh, and so just it, like it kind of happened over a long period of time and then all at once where I realized like, oh, it, it has to be the opening of the film instead of the climax. Mm-hmm. And then I, I spent five days in my buddy PJ McCabe's basement um, just writing. It was like a, I was working during the day, and then I would go to his basement at night mm. and, and write. And it was just like a very quiet experience. And I, I listened to Bruce Springsteen's album, Nebraska, wrote it. And the way that I write is all oral. It's, it's never really in screenplay format. A lot of it is just like... Yep speaking out the scenes out loud, playing all of the characters and generally looking like a lunatic mm. uh, in this, in this basement and then writing down the best stuff. So we just, I just improv each scene a thousand times until it's, so it's there. That's like the vomit draft. So I just get everything out. Yep. And then once it's done, I'll like do revisions and revisions and revisions and I'll read it out loud and record it with a podcast so that I have an idea of how it's going to actually play together. And, and then in hearing it, I'll be able to put in music and sound design. And then once that's ready, I'll send a draft to friends and um, producers and stuff like that. But still, it's really difficult to get anybody to read a screenplay. So instead, I, I just do the podcast. And I oh, send, my God. Uh, like I, I sent, brilliant. I sent the, the feature screenplay to, to friends of my best friends of mine, and I still could get them to read it after... A couple of weeks, but as soon as I sent them like the podcast audiobook version, I had like two or three phone calls within you know two hours after I sent it to people. So it's like they instantly listened to it, um, and so the, I was able to like take their notes and workshop that into um, kind of a shooting script, and then we shot it in mm-hmm. November in 14 days. So I like I probably had the first draft finished by March, and then we were ready to shoot by November. It was crazy. That is. So wait, so, but the podcast is just, it's like an intranet podcast or an intra podcast. It's not, it's meant for internally for like for your collaborators. It's not, yeah, it's, you never... not, it's not available. No, there, there's a, there's a couple of podcasts of my features that I've, that I've done that are available. Really? That are like my kid's adventure film uh, movie, the reinvention is on SoundCloud and I think it's on the iTunes store, but it's like, just a dream project that I really want to do. And, and instead of like expecting somebody to understand the, I don't know, the delivery of the lines or the context of the scene, I was just like, all right, fuck it. I'm just going to record it. It's mm-hmm. going to take me a day to record this thing. And then I'll mix it when I'm doing something else. So I was like on the handmaid's tale in Toronto for a week and they only needed me for two days. And so I spent like three days in my hotel room mixing the reinvention podcast, um, and then I have that forever, so I can share that with anybody who wants yeah. to like help out with the movie. Um, but yeah, no, the, the Thunder Road podcast was something that I was just using for cast and crew and producers to be like, Makes sense. this is the movie. I guarantee you it's going to be 90 minutes. <laughs> and like also, right. like this is how each scene is going to play out. This is like the base level of what I'm hoping for performance and pacing and cadence. And then all of the actors and the crew were able to just amp what I had already done audio visually um up and make it what the movie is now so you played all the parts on on the in this on this audiobook podcast yeah wow interesting idea because i guess you know i'm struggling also i it's writing something yeah it, it, it's like you're getting it all out you're improvising it, it makes a complete sense uh it's a format which really is much more just sort of simpatico for that you know it doesn't make it's much harder to try yeah. to pull anything off like that lowing excuse me writing is such a such a more laborious and time consuming process and yeah and also it's like this that's how it's going to end up it's going to end up coming out of people's vocal cords why would you spend hours and hours writing flowery prose you know and descriptions and like you know, and dialogue that might not sound good coming out of uh, somebody's throat. Like, yeah. just, you you have to speak it out loud. You have to, like, act it out and understand the context of the scene. I mean, like, that's how everybody writes. Armando Iannucci's team, you know, they film the actors speaking, and then they write down the stuff that makes everybody laugh. It's like, 
you know, humor is so performative. It's like, it's like the, the reason why we laugh at stuff is because it's based almost entirely on performance and delivery. So, like, the fact that you would write comedy specifically for an audiovisual spectrum on an, a piece of white paper with black text is just insane to me, hmm. at least to start. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, I really, actually, I think it might be, I'd love to hear that at some point when it, when, if you don't mind, um, I can sign an NDR, but, you know, but those don't really, <laughs> yeah, hold, those I'll, don't hold. Uh, those, those, once the, once yeah. the movie gets up, once the movie's yeah. out, I'm sure I'll share that. It's like, uh, and I'll, I'll post that what? on Twitter to be like, Hey, this is what the movie sounded like. Cause I'm, I'm sure that there are scenes in it of like heads and tails. It might be interesting to, to somebody who's seen the movie of like, Oh, they cut this one small moment or like. That mm -hmm. could be nice for film students to mm -hmm. realize that you have to build the plane while you're flying it and that it's not always pretty or exactly how it's written. Right. But it's interesting how a, a concept of sort of born in laziness ends up being really ingenuity, you know, like a product of ingenuity. Because <laughs> yeah. you did, you know, it's, I, I'm kidding, but it's it, the idea of recording it is it just seems so much more liberating and less you know, easier on so many, I know it, it has its challenges, uh, in its own way, of course, doing, uh, like the audio version of it. But I, I just know like writing my own first screenplay myself, it's just like, I find the con there's so, I'm so there's so many confines to the screenplay formatting and everything else. And it's just slowing me down and dragging me down. And this seems like a, a real sort of, you know, just practical solution to that well yeah. done well done well, well i think you said sorry to interrupt but, but i think no. you say that mm -hmm. um because it's easier for you to do a podcast or you're used to it but yeah. like really there are general filmmakers mm -hmm. students that you know you, you're going to have this screenplay and it has to be perfectly formatted and somebody's going to read it and give a shit mm -hmm. and like give you money or give you uh, a green light to go and make something and that's just imaginary it's not true that doesn't happen and right. so like there are these generations of kids generally who are, ex are wasting so much time doing this thing that is screenplay format instead of doing what you do every day of recording something that's in audio format editing it and mixing it and putting it out and like that that's easy for us but the barrier of entry for some of these kids is really it's it's, it's sad it's different it's like I feel like you and I have an education on how to make something compelling that just a screenwriter doesn't have. And, mm -hmm. like, that's such a crucial education to making something that's a longer duration. And I think it can be sometimes very scary and um, prohibitive for some people to be able to do it. And so, like, yeah, everything that I do is to, is to try and help that. Like, we for, for our lab... Um, we have this like Malibu lab that I'm doing in September called Short to Feature Lab, where we like bring in filmmakers who are short filmmakers and then are trying to make a feature. And the first thing we did was reach out to Adobe and all these other software companies to see if we could get kids free software and teach them how to use it. Because like, yeah, man, it, it, it can be a very frightening endeavor and people sometimes spend their whole lives stuck in screenplay format, never doing anything audiovisual. Um, so it might be easy to us, but uh, that's that's not the the majority of the population in the film mm -hmm. world, bro. Right. Absolutely. Well, thanks for sharing that with me. Oh, it's inspiring. It's a good thing to know about. I could try that. Just just working things out, like all the, you know, as you write a story and you're making up a story, it's it's only once you're kind of developing where you realize, okay, I have to now go back and change something because it just now doesn't make sense, you know, or it's illogical. Yeah. Uh, you know, only something you learn from the writing process and from figuring out the logistics of what your characters are doing, et cetera. So yeah. interesting. Thunder Road is still playing in festivals, is it not? Yeah, it's, we're very lucky. It's playing in about 22 festivals, some of them internationally. So like mm -hmm. um, we're screening in, I actually don't know which ones I can announce yet, but we're screening in some really incredible top tier festivals around the world and then just really incredible local festivals in the United States. So, yeah. like, just festivals that have been putting on awesome programs for the last 30 years sometimes uh, and have, like, really wonderful, diverse followings of um, cinephiles that travel to these festivals. Uh -huh. and, and also, like, friends and family. But by this point, because Thunder Road was a, a short film, we have festivals reaching out just for screeners. And so, like, 
it doesn't cost us anything to submit that people are like offering us waiver codes, which is so cool. So like, I think after, after submitting to the first few big film festivals, um, we didn't really pay for festival submissions because yeah. we had so many people reaching out to be like, Hey, can I get a copy of the movie? And sometimes it would be like, Hey, so, you know, here's a waiver code. You can submit it and our programmers will watch it as well. Mm-hmm. It was really great. Um, so yeah, we're very lucky. We're going to be screening at a bunch of different festivals or in well, sidewalk films. Um, at Sidewalk Film Festival in, I think, a week. Yep. Uh, I think that's the next festival that we're seeing. Yep, at. yep. That's a great festival. It's in Alabama, right? Yeah. Uh, well, you yeah. keep saying you're lucky, and I wonder, is it really luck when you, like, you know, kick your own ass and, you know, really work on something and are passionate about it and put in so much effort and work with talented people? It's really just a, a product of... Of that, <laughs> as opposed to luck. But I, I, I'm there's just sort good, of, uh, I'm just getting. A good line of my dad. He says, um, uh-huh. I, "I noticed my luck started to change when I started working for." Right. I like that one. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's absolutely the case. Oh yeah, and not only are you not having, are you getting fees waivered, submission fees anyway? But you're, I assume you're being offered fees. Uh, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice place to find yourself navigating of the festivals is is you know it's always such a tricky thing you know you don't want to you have to deal with a lot of moving parts and when it's at this point now where you don't have to worry about the premiere and you don't have to worry about submission fees then you can really lay sit back and and really immerse yourself and enjoy that whole part of it um sounds like yeah it's been it's been really cool and yeah i i never really think about strategy or, or uh-huh. anything like that when it comes to screening at festivals. I see them as like, yeah, as like a summer camp or something like that. And then, well, well, I mean, yeah, I think I might be doing so much over the last um, year and a half or two years that like now it's just about mm-hmm. just making sure that everybody else has all the tools that they need. Like, sure. I, I, I don't know, my, my first film festival that I went to was uh, South by Southwest 2013. And I was terrified, and I made a bunch of business cards, and I like went around and handed out business cards to people, and met a thousand people in doing that. Some of which I still hang out with a lot. Like mm-hmm. I met Jeremy Hirsch at South by Southwest 2013, um, and and we're good buddies now. Yeah, I think like I, I, the the festival has been the festival circuit has been relatively demystified. It's to help out and curate and chaperone the next generation of film. And I feel like I was scared of it for a long time and I was intimidated and like worried about, you know, where we premiere and stuff like that. But now it's like, no, I just want to get the movie out there. And I think, I think the future of film is that it's just filmmakers who are basically talented influencers who are able to make something on a small budget and then release it on iTunes and um, also encourage a festival tour with their movie just by like, saying, hey, we have this movie and it's done. If y'all want to play it, that would be lovely. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I have a, a, a weird perspective on, on festivals where now I'm like just, uh, I don't know, a sounding board for people to be like, okay, how, how can I help? Like, what, what are you guys actually looking to do? And maybe maybe this isn't the right fit for something like Sundance because it just doesn't, they don't program things like this, but also but like Fantastic Fest does or like Fantasia Fest does. And like, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like, now I've just become this, um, I don't know, a chaperone myself. It's terrible. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I guess that's a great attitude to have. But, you know, it's also, uh, you, you, you do have to um, start to strategize, right? With, and carefully and cautiously, I assume, when you're moving into distribution phase. But I, I, I mean, maybe not. I don't know. I think, I think really, like, like the, the festival... Really, and that's that's why we've, got, we've won. You know, we won Sundance and we won South by Southwest, and we've had our, you know the, the movie screen in Cannes. It's like uh, I feel like I'm already on the world stage. Film yeah, you are for yeah. discoveries. It's for people who um, should be encouraged and um, I don't know pointed out as doing something really unique and new and cool, and and also like giving them the encouragement to pursue film as a career that they might not have anyway. Like we already know that we're going to be making movies for the rest of our lives, and so mm-hmm. I see. Mm-hmm. I see festivals as this awesome, um, yeah, chaperone in that sense of like discovering people who are making movies that are incredible all over the world that might not have um, somebody saying these people are worthwhile. And 
um, yeah, certainly that was us, and now it's kind of our job to to do the same for others. Well, I really like the the uh, whole sensibility as you describe it because there is this sort of laid out plan that you're supposed to follow, but you know, then it becomes it feels like a factory produced type of film after a while you know if you're just going through that same process as everybody else rather than really allow this organic an organic journey for your film to happen the way it's supposed to happen you know it's 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 kind of refreshing to hear you because i i've said many times i feel like the festival circuit can actually be a form of distribution for a lot of filmmakers but they always they can't really appreciate it that much because there's a lot of pressure to find the right salesperson you know and distributor get it in front of you know yeah there's a lot of pressure you know on a lot of filmmakers yeah, there, there was for a long time but i think the, all that world's going away a little like, bit but you're allowing if, if it hasn't if it hasn't already like sorry but like no it's right um, mm -hmm. the, the future is self-distribution like uh, th that used to be the way where right. you know it, at Sundance in the '90s, I heard stories of people mm -hmm. um, who distribution companies would come up with a suitcase full of like two hundred thousand dollars, like I'm going to buy your movie right now, and like people would turn down those offers because they could get a better offer the next week or something like that. That world is is so long gone, and now is this like strange daydream and like gambling addiction for filmmakers of mm -hmm. like. Oh, that I'm going to go to a film festival and do really well, and that somebody's going to come along and give me a lot of money, and and I'll be sitting pretty, and I'll be able, and I'll have a two picture deal. Like that just doesn't happen. And it, and and really, the the self distribution model is getting so um, it possible. Like the fact that you can upload your movie to Quiver, this iTunes aggregator, which is what any smaller distribution company would be doing anyway. It costs like eleven hundred dollars. You can do it yourself. And then you can build all of these Facebook ads yourself to hit your exact audience. That is what any distribution company would be doing, except you'd be paying their salaries as well. So, so we won South by Southwest for this feature. We went to Cannes. We were in the you know selection at Cannes, and we sold the film to a few different territories. France was one of them. We met this lovely distribution company, and they're helping us out. And it's an incredible partnership, and that's great. We found juggernauts over there that loved us and loved the movie. Same thing with the territory of Japan. But then in the United States, we only got predatory offers. We got offers for like less than half of the budget of the movie. Yeah. And we didn't have a big budget movie. No. Our movie cost $200,000 and the best offer we got was a hundred grand. So, so we had like front row seats to see just how horrible the film distribution world has become and why you wouldn't want to do that in the first place. That you, you take a deal um, because it's the best deal that you have instead of spending the next six months putting it out yourself. And Sundance Creative Distribution Lab put out this incredible case study about this film called Columbus that was at Sundance 2017. And they got terrible offers um, that all dried up a few months after it premiered. It was screwed. Um, and the movie cost three quarters of a million dollars, and they were able to recoup specifically from iTunes and the theatrical run and um, television rights and selling dollars. It was like mm -hmm. at least twice as much. I, mean, I think it's like three times as much now than the highest distributor offered them. It's like it's a no-brainer, and 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 we cannot keep deluding ourselves that if we're going to make something that's ninety minutes, somebody's going to come by and swoop us up. That world doesn't exist anymore. You, as the filmmaker and possible self-distributor, are their competition. There you go. A new voice pushing back. <laughs> I appreciate it. No, I mean, it's so refreshing. I appreciate you really sharing and being so transparent. Because, I mean, you may have those feelings as you described them, the, you know, but to share them with with my dozens of listeners... <laughs> with my tens that's, of listeners. No, dude, I mean, I'm serious. Well, like, not with, like, I know, really, I know, I know you are. Like, for, for me, um, like, making this stuff, all these filmmakers end up doing this work, and, and like, we've, we've been able to see from the top of the mountain. So, like, we, we have, yeah. we're privileged in that we've gotten as far as we have. But I think about these hundreds, if not thousands, of filmmakers who are planning on doing this thing in order to make their money back or to make a living or to live above the poverty line. And they just get bad influences and mm -hmm. bad encouragement, bad, and advice. bad education, yeah. what this world is like. So 
if I can tell anybody what the real landscape of independent film distribution is like, and I'm telling you, it's going to become part of public um, knowledge very soon. Like, self-distribution was a scary thing, and also, like, you, you have this image of somebody selling DVDs out of their van rather than what the world is actually like. The fact that, like, you are able to impersonate a distributor so well now that you're, you're doing the exact same thing that they'd be doing, except you're also paying the overhead of their incredible offices in Brooklyn before you see it funny. It doesn't make any sense. It's like, yeah, the young filmmakers should be aspiring to be more like Mark and Jay Duclos, mm-hmm. you know, or uh, Joe Swanberg than anybody else. That's the real future. I agree. Thank you for sharing. I feel like uh, we're just basic, barely getting started. I have a ton more kind of questions for you, and I certainly don't feel like I talked enough about Thunder Road, but people can't really see it unless they're going to go to, like, Sidewalk or uh, get on. Get People should get on to the Thunder Road, like, Facebook page, follow the so at least they can uh, see where it's going to be playing, uh, screening, hopefully near them, uh, but eventually before it goes into some sort of platform where everybody can see it. Promise me we'll do a part two because um, I really wasn't even prepared, frankly, for your going off like this. I don't appreciate it. So, so fuck, <laughs> fuck you and fuck your whole plan. No, I, it's, <laughs> this is great. You should listen to. Uh, it sounds like maybe you listen to some of the some of my shows, but you know, uh, yeah. there's some that where people kind of do talk about working, finding. Well, I don't want to say alternative or, you know, but, but another way of thinking. And I, and I appreciate any time I can talk about that. So thanks for, for doing that. So I'll just keep my, the audience, my audience of dozens and hundreds of people. I'll keep them uh, abreast of, of how they can see Thunder Road. And uh, people already know that they can go to Filmstruck and see a bunch of your short works. Uh, I'm not going to plug other ways of seeing the short works while we're plugging Filmstruck. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. But I, I write. I mean, uh, although you... C- yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think we have, like, four of our single-stake shorts on my Vimeo channel. Okay, so we're going to um, talk about the Vimeo yeah, channel, and, that's and, like, right. The, yeah. the feature version of Minutes is on Vimeo VOD, oh. but really, Filmstruck is, like, the way to see it. Film, like, it, it, they, they have this nice little interview with me, then they do, right. like, a breakdown of all this, like, really cool behind-the-scenes footage of Dustin and me on set. It's like, yep. It's actually really funny to watch. and uh, I enjoyed it. I don't know. I, I, it's very demystifying, yeah, of like what the film experience is like. It's not this clean, pretty set with like, it's not a Spielberg set. It's a summer camp that we happen to make movies during. <laughs> it's like a copper enameling in, in arts and crafts, only you're making movies instead. Since you brought up Vimeo, I'm going to tell people they can see this, the short of Thunder Road as well on the Vimeo page if you want to see that with the song. And um, just an FYI to people listening. All right. So fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me. Well, anytime. And I I definitely mean it when I say I would like to do a part two. Well, you know, in a three and a four down the road, we just stay in touch. Um, Anytime. Thanks. So thank you. Thank you so much, dude. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Have a great day. All right. See you, boy. Bye-bye.